Good afternoon. This is the Tuesday edition of E&E &E Weekly. I am Joycelyn Elakeche Ada. Today's top stories, oil price rose in early trade this morning, up from sharp overnight losses on Monday due to continued gloom over the outlook for global demand as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to rage. The federal government reportedly spent 8.94 trillion naira on all subsidy between 2006 and 2015. As NMPC Group Managing Director says, the benefits of fuel subsidy were enjoyed by marketers and not the masses that it was targeted at. Nigerians face imminent fuel scarcity as the Nigerian Association of Road Transport Owners, NATO, the umbrella body of all commercial vehicles owners in Nigeria begins a two-day warning strike starting today. And on environmental matters, toxins produced by cyan bacteria said to be responsible for deaths of hundreds of elephants in Botswana. This story is and more after this short break. Welcome to Energy and Environment Weekly. All rose in early trade this morning, up sharp overnight losses as the latest tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico lost strength. But worries about fuel demand have been persisting with rising trends around the globe in coronavirus cases. U.S. West Texas Intermediate rose 26 cents or 0.7 percent to $39.57 a barrel while Brent crude rose 13 cents or 0.3% to $41.57 a barrel. Crude prices started to recover as Texas refineries stayed open despite forecast of heavy flooding. With tropical storm better expected to keep losing strength, allowing worries about U.S. refinery demand for feedstock. Both oil benchmarks fell around 4% on Monday uh, hit by rising concerns that an increase in coronavirus cases in major markets could spur fresh lockdowns and hot demands that raised the possibility that Libyan oil could return when it isn't needed. Markets are nervous about demand in places like the United Kingdom, where fresh restrictions are being imposed. U.S. health officials are also warning of a new wave in the coming winter. U.S. crude oil and gasoline stock stockpiles likely fell last week, uh, while inventories of distillates, including diesel, were seen climbing a preliminary Reuters poll showed. The international oil benchmark, Brent crude, fell be uh, below $40 a barrel uh, mark on Monday amid uh, demand worries as the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries further cuts its outlook de uh, for demand growth. Nigeria, Africa's biggest oil producer, said its crude oil production rose slightly to 1.36 million barrels per day in August. That's from the 1.35 million barrels per day in July, according to OPEC. OPEC, in its monthly oil market report for September, said the crude oil production by the 13-member cartel increased by 760,000 barrels per day to an average of 24.05 million barrels per day in August. On Monday, oil prices were down as production looked set to resume in Libya. Traders fretted over the potential heat to prices from higher output in Libya 
as its National Oil Corporation indicated production would resume despite the ongoing civil war. OPEC and its allies are watching efforts to resume oil output in Libya very closely. OPEC sources said producers should wait to see if there is a sustainable restart before reacting. OPEC member Libya is exempted from cutting oil output under a deal by the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and Allies. A restart in Libya supply could force other producers to make further reductions to support prices. All prices were weakened by the possible return of Libyan production, which has been virtually shut down since January, and as rising coronavirus cases added to worries about global demand. OPEC and its allies, known as OPEC Plus, made a record cut in supply of 9.7 million barrels per day from May 1st to support prices as the coronavirus case, uh, crisis knocked down demand. But OPEC Plus tapered the cut to 7.7 .7 million barrels per day from August 1st. Let's now look at OPEC members' current oil prices for today. take a short break now when we return group managing director of the nigerian national petroleum corporation nmpc says benefits of fuel subsidy never enjoyed by the timmy masses but members of a marketing cabal we'll be right back <laughs> Welcome back to Energy and Environment Weekly. We are starting off with PPPRA. The federal government reportedly spent a total of 8.94 trillion naira on all subsidy between 2006 and 2015. The PPPRA said the subsidy was paid to all marketers and the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, in the period under review. It noted, however, that since 2016, the NMPC had been the sole importer of the product to the country, that's referring to crude oil. It assured that subsequent releases would reveal that uh, the amount paid on subsidy before the deregulation of the downstream oil sector. But in a related development, the Group Managing Director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NMPC, Marla Mele Kiari, disclosed that the benefits of the fuel subsidy regime were enjoyed by members of a market cabal engaged in fuel marketing and not the masses that it was targeted at. The GMD said in a radio program in Kaduna that subsidy was removed because it was characterized by fraudulent activities. He explained that a subsidy was not beneficial to the masses who are the original target beneficiaries. The government therefore removed it with a plan to reinvest on projects that will have a direct impact on the masses. Malam Kerry explained that the money from subsidy payments can be channeled to other areas of development. Earlier this month, the federal government foreclosed reinstating the fuel subsidy regime as outrage grew over the hike in the ex-depot price of petrol 
that jacked up from the pump price uh, between 145 naira and 148 naira per liter to 158 naira and uh, 162 naira band. The GMD defended the fuel subsidy removal, saying it constituted a drain on the country's meager resources. Under the fuel subsidy system, the commodity is retailed at a price lower than the landing cost with the federal government paying the differential which runs into billions and trillions of naira. In place of the subsidy, the government explained that henceforth, prices of the product will be determined by the vagaries of the international crude oil market, stressing that incurring further cost on under recovery has now been stopped permanently. Meanwhile, NMPC has reaffirmed its commitment to the pursuit of a 35% women inclusion in its workforce. A press statement by the corporation spokesperson, Dr. Kenny Obateru, noted that the group managing director made the commitment when the executive chairman of the Federal Character Commission, FCC, Dr. Muhiba Dankaka, visited him in Abuja. Marlon Carey stated that the National Oil Company, as a responsible corporate entity, has always provided a level playing field for all, thereby granting equal employment opportunity to Nigerians from all classes and backgrounds. He said NMPC would continue to comply with the rules and regulations of the Commission on Recruitment. The statement noted that the NMPC was applauded for ensuring a high level of gender balance in management positions in the corporation. And following the coronavirus-induced sharp drop in its revenues, the federal government reduced its spending on oil and gas assets being developed through joint ventures with private firms by 61.83% in July. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, which represents the federal government in the GVS, has an obligation to make cash call payment for the development of the assets. The NMPC's cash call payment fell to $94.84 million, which is 34.14 billion naira in July, and that is from the 248.48 million dollars, uh, which is in naira is 84.45 billion uh, naira in the previous month. The corporation's latest data showed this. The nation's oil and gas production structure is majorly split between the JV, that's onshore, and in the shallow waters and the production sharing contracts in deep water offshore. Under the JV arrangement, both the NMPC and the private firms continue, contribute to the funding of operations in the proportion of their equity holdings and generally receive the produced crude oil in the same ratio. NMPC said the total export receipt of $122.44 million was recovered in July as against the $378.42 million in June. The national oil firm also said it remitted the sum of 70.15 billion naira to the Federation Account Allocation Committee. Production from the JV asset has declined over the past few years. This is partly due to funding constraints occasioned by the NMPC's inability to fulfill its cash call obligations and uh, when due. The JVS accounted for 33.20% of the average daily production of 1.69 million barrels recorded in June. This is according to the NMPC data. The Federation crude oil and gas lifting is classified into equity export and domestic, both of which are lifted and marketed by the NMPC and the proceeds remitted into the Federation account. The equity export receipts after adjusting for the JV cash calls are paid directly into the Federation account domiciled in the Central Bank of Nigeria. Domestic crude oil of 440 uh, 445,000 barrels per day is allocated for refining to meet domestic product supply.
Payments are effected to the Federation account by the NMPC after removing crude and product losses. Pipeline repairs and management cost also is removed. And moving on, still on NMPC, the Group Managing Director, Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation, Marla Melikeri, has called for a clear separation of roles between industry operators and regulators in the oil and gas sector. He said this will improve competitiveness in the industry. Marlon Carey also cautioned against the wholesale deployment of local skills in the industry, arguing that from his experience, doing so comes with a high cost. He stressed the importance of uh, foreign investment, saying you can't but rely on foreign investment if you want to grow in the oil sector. End of quote. The GMD maintained that the thin line between the regulator and operators within the industry had become problematic and leading to decreasing competition within the sector. He said that as the nation goes into refining laws, it's important that it uh, delineates the role of the operator from the regulator. He remarked that Nigeria was experiencing cross-function of the Nigerian Content Board in operations as well as regulation in the upstream oil and gas sector. Malam Kerry further lamented the high cost of doing business. He said that the levies charged by the NCDMB, as an example, was too high. He also called for the more attention to be given to education to reflect what is happening in the industry, saying that the misalignment was affecting the sector. And the Vice President, Professor Yemi Osibajo, says the problems associated with Nigeria refineries will persist if the federal government continues to own and run them. The Vice President made the observation at a virtual meeting organized for the All Progressive Congress social media bloggers and influencers at the APC National Secretariat in Abuja. He remarked that if the refinery is left in the hands of the government, it will continue to experience the same problems it is experiencing now. He added that it should be the business of the private sector which is why the government is trying to focus on assisting the private sector to develop modular refineries. He stated that, uh, is, that there is a, a 100,000 barrel capacity refinery about to come on stream by the next year, which is completely private and closely located near the Port Harcourt refinery so that it can share the facilities of the Port Harcourt refinery. Professor Sibajo further disclosed that there are also six modular refineries that are almost ready. He stated that there is Niger Delta Petroleum Refinery in Delta State and another in Imo and yet another in Edo State. Meanwhile, global oil refiners reeling from months of lackluster demand and an abundance of inventories are cutting fuel production because the recovery in demand from the impact of coronavirus has stalled. Refiners caught output by as much as 35% as coronavirus lockdowns destroyed the need for travel. As lockdowns begin to ease, refiners increased output slowly through late August, but in top fuel consumer, the United States and elsewhere, Refiners have been decreasing rates for the last several weeks in response to increased inventories, a sustained lack of demand and in response to natural disasters. The heat to capacity has been most notable in China. The second largest fuel consumer led the world in all demand recovery after taming its outbreak of coronavirus. But its refiners also export fuel and those shipments have been weak due to the virus effect on fuel demand in other Asian nations. U.S. fuel demand has fallen 13% year on year on, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Autumn is typically when use of heating oil and diesel rises, but with more than 179 million barrels in storage, nearly a record, Refiners have no incentive to keep units running. 
The Paris-based International Energy Agency cuts its forecast for global oil demand for 2020 for the second time in two months, uh, last week due to the faltering recovery. The energy watchdog forecasts global consumption of petroleum and liquid fuels will average 91.7 million barrels per day for all of 2020. U.S. refiners are still producing 20% less fuel than before the pandemic, operating at 76% of overall capacity, lowest for this time of the year since 2008. Meanwhile, Chinese, India, Japanese, and South Korean refineries cut their utilization rates from July and August. Japan, which is the world's third largest crude importer, cuts its refinery utilization rate to 65.9% in the week through September, 12 down from nearly 72% in mid-August. We'll take a break, and when we return uh, with the strike, uh, the threat of strike by the National Union of Road Transport Owners, NATO. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Nigerians face imminent fuel scarcity following the decision by the Nigerian Association of Road Transport Owners, NATO, the umbrella body of all commercial vehicles owners in Nigeria, to embark on a two-day warning strike beginning from today. The organization, which engages in the haulage of petroleum products, general cargoes, and movement of goods and passages within the country and the West African sub-region, noted that thereafter it will issue a 10-day ultimatum for a full-blown industrial dispute. On a press briefing yesterday, NATO said it received with shock the recent government decision to place an immediate ban on all petroleum trucks above 45,000 liter capacity from plying Nigerian roads. National President of the group, Alahaji Yusuf Otman, told newsmen that the body considered it as insensitive and unappreciative of the efforts and contributions of the NATO members as businessmen and investors in the very critical and sensitive distribution and supply chain of petroleum products across the country. NATO stated that following the total collapse of petroleum product pipelines and strategic depots across the country as a result of the economic sabotage by vandals, the government had pleaded with private investors to assist in uh, ameliorating the situation by ensuring that product scarcity is brought to the barest minimum. It stressed that it was in response to the call that many of its members took the initiative to invest heavily in expanding their fleet of various capacities to deliver products to all nooks and crannies of the country. The statement explained that members took loans from various commercial banks with very high interest rates and with no form of support from the government. The statement concluded that it was distressing and discouraging that when it was discovered that one of the side effects of the efforts to fix the problem is the fact that the Nigerian roads were not built to accommodate vehicles that carry loads in the excess of 30 tons. The government introduced a new policy on maximum capacity on our roads, and NATO says that has been detrimental effect to the haulage business. It noted that though it is not against the decision of the government considering the dilapidated state of Nigerian road, it is particularly concerned about the sudden nature of the ban. NATO lamented that the huge investment the owners of the trucks who had run into debt incurred is in executing the mandate given by government were not considered. 
It was in view of the decision that NATO said it is constrained to allow the decision of all members to pack their trucks as from today, the 22nd, to the 23rd September 2020 as warning. Furthermore, NATO issued a 10-day ultimatum with effect from 24th September 2020 for a full-blown withdrawal of service. And on environmental matters, the death of hundreds of elephants that died earlier this year has been attributed to ingesting toxins from produced by cyan bacteria. According to government officials, the country will be testing water holes for algal blooms next rainy season to reduce the risk of another mass die-off. The mysterious deaths of 350 elephants in the Okavango Delta between May and June baffled conservationists with leading theories such that they were killed by a rodent virus known as EMC or toxins from algal blooms. Local sources suggest 70% of elephants died near water holes containing algal blooms, which can produce toxic microscopic organism called cyanobacteria toxins were initially ruled out because no other species died except for one horse. But scientists now think elephants could be particularly susceptible because they spend a lot of time baiting and drinking large quantities of water. In July, the government's official count was 281 vets, but this has now risen to 330 deaths. Reuben said uh, he would be monitoring water holes for blooms next rainy season to avoid another die-off. It is important to monitor now to effectively detect the growth of these algal blooms in the water, he said. Climate change is increasing both the intensity and severity of harmful global blooms, making this issue more likely to reoccur. McCain confirmed he was working with officials to set up regional early warning systems. Across the border in Zimbabwe, more than 20 dead elephants were found between Harangi National Park and Victoria Falls in August, with concerns that the two incidents could be linked. Authorities currently believe this die-off was caused by a bacterial infection. And that's all we can take on E&E &E today. Remember, you can watch this episode and previous episodes of the program on its YouTube page. Simply search for E&E &E Weekly. Thanks for watching. I am Joycelyn Elakeche Ada. Good afternoon.